uh, share the screen? Yes, please. Okay, okay. Oh, it shows uh, uh, the uh, host does not allow. Ah, okay. Yes, one moment, please. Okay, okay. Aparentemente, Weking Liu todavía no tiene habilitados los derechos para compartir pantalla. ¿Nos pueden ayudar, por favor? Y nos indican cuando esté listo. Ready, Waking. Can you try again? Share, uh, sharing you to share your screen, please. Uh, yes. Ah, perfect. We can see your presentation. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, first of all, welcome uh, to everybody. Thank you to be here. This is the third session of the webinars called. Terahertz applications based on emerging and high performance electronic devices, part three. These talks are part of the activities regarding Eugenio Mendez do Curro Institutional Chair. These webinars will be held in English. The questions can be sent by using the question and answers chat in the Zoom platform or by using the YouTube chat. Dr. Kweking Liu, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Troy, USA, will present the subject, Compact Field Effect Transistors Models for Terahertz Detection. Kweking Liu received the Bachelor and Master Degrees from the Hua Xiong University of Science and Technology, Wuhan, China, in 2009 and 2012, respectively, and the PhD degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Troy, New York, USA, in 2019. He is currently a postdoctoral research associate with Rensselaer, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His current research interest includes modeling and simulation of semiconductor devices. Dr. Liu, you have 30 minutes of presentation, and then there will be a 15 minute question and answer session. Please, on your own. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, uh, my presentation topic today is uh, compact field effect transistor models for terrorist detection. Here is the outline of the, uh, my research project. First, I will uh, introduce the background and then talk about the theory of uh, terrorist detection with field effect transistors. Then we'll uh, describe our terrorist compact model for a wide frequency range. And finally, make the uh, conclusion. First is uh, the background. So uh, oh, uh, basically uh, my research is within the uh, terrorist gap, which is uh, known uh, from one, about 100 gigahertz from to uh, 10 terahertz. And uh, in this uh, frequency range, there could be uh, many applications like uh, the real-time terrorist spectrometer, uh, hidden object scanning, non-destructive testing of ICs, 
and also uh, the telephone band communication. And uh, uh, my research is uh, mainly on the terrorist transistor detectors. So uh, there are various terrorist detectors, including thermal detectors, shocky barrier de uh, diode detectors, and also the terrorist transistor detectors. So uh, compared with the uh, other uh, terrorist detectors, the transistor terrorist detectors could uh, have uh, um, the advantages of uh, low cost, uh, good tunability, uh, fast uh, response speed, and room temperature detection. Uh, but uh, uh, it needs to be uh, improved in terms of like the high responsivity, uh, high sensitivity, and uh, the commercialization. Uh, as we know, the uh, SPICE models are the building blocks for the integrated circuit and the uh, uh, system designs. And uh, uh, the chip design cost is increasing with the technology development. So the modeling is uh, very important for the device and chip design. Uh, next, I will introduce the theory of terrorist detection with field effect transistors. So, um, the operating uh, principle of terrorist detection with FETs could be uh, illustrated with uh, uh, this schematic. So, for I will use a uh, gallium arsenide hand as uh, the example. So when the terrorist radiation is impinging on, on a FET with a, a symmetric boundary conditions, the terrorist field could be, uh, the terrorist uh, field could be in, uh, induced between the contacts. So the terrorist field could induce the electron density oscillations in the channel to generate plasma wave. So plasma uh, wave is basically uh, the oscillations of electron density. And this is uh, associated with the uh, inertia. Uh, we could understand this uh, with the, the following example. So when like uh, uh, the uh, localized terrace field causes a localized change in the carrier density, for example, a decrease in the electron concentration, then there will be an excess of uh, positive charge. And the electrons in the vicinity of the positive charge will get attracted and move towards the positive charge. Due to inertia, they will overshoot. Uh, however, due to attraction, they have to return, but overshoot again as a result of the inertia. So this process leads to the oscillations of the electron density or the plasma wave. Uh, with the asymmetric boundary conditions, the plasma wave uh, excited by this uh, terrorist radiation could uh, propagate from the source side to the channel to uh, the drain side. And uh, uh, depending on the size, it, the plasma wave could either decay or uh, reach the drain side. And uh, uh, the terrorist AC voltage could modulate both the carrier density and the carrier drift velocity. And this will in induce the nonlinear terrorist AC current in the channel.
and uh, uh, because of the nonlinearity, the tariff AC current could get rectified, which will lead to the uh, measurable DC tariff, uh, DC voltage at the drain, which is known as the tariff response. And uh, in the practical uh, application of the tariff detectors, we usually have a, a low resistance applied in the measurement. So uh, the mechanism for tariff detection is because the plasma wave velocity is much faster than the carrier drift velocity. This will uh, enable the submicron uh, field fetch transistors to be able to operate in the plasma mode, which is well above the cutoff frequency of the transistors. So uh, this slide shows uh, uh, the terrorist detection could be either non-resonant or resonant, depending on the uh, frequency of the terrorist radiation and also the uh, feature length of the device. Like for the lung, lung gate device, the, ter the plasma wave would decay before reaching the drain. So the uh, detection is uh, non-resonant or broadband. For short gate device, the plasma wave could get re uh, re could reach the drain, uh, get uh, reflected, and forms a form a standing wave, and that could be a resonant detection. And uh, uh, a theoretical analysis has uh, been done, uh, and uh, the analytical detector response. Could be uh, has been uh, derived from the Jacknoff Shure theory. The equations are uh, listed here. Uh, we can show we can uh, see that uh, the response is uh, a function of for uh, various parameters, including the uh, terrorist radiation, a uh, magnitude or frequency, and uh, mobility of the uh, electron in the uh, channel of the FET and also the uh, dimensions of the FET detectors and also the bias. Uh, next, I will talk about the Terra's compact model for a wide frequency range. So what do you want to model for a wide frequency range? Uh, because uh, there could be uh, like the frequency dependent applications of operating the terrorist devices. For example, uh, the tunable resonant detection, a spectroscopy for chemical and biological sensing. This example shows a frequency dependent application uh, in the like, uh, biomedical sensing. And also uh, there are limitations of existing models at terrorist frequencies. The existing industry standard transistor models such as uh, BSIM are used for CMOS devices with peak color frequency around 100 gigahertz which is below the terrorist uh, frequency regime. So uh, it is uh, highly motivated to uh, study the models for higher frequencies. And uh, uh, our ob objective of modeling for a wide frequency range includes extending the existing spice models into the terrorist reg uh, regime and establish the terrorist spice models valid in the wide terrorist frequency range. And also use, we uh, want to use the terrorist spice model in the design and applications of terrorist devices and circuits. So uh, I will describe, uh, I will use two examples 
for this in, uh, once to verify the theoretical test response of a proposed spectrometer. Another is to assist the design of tetras fat detectors for resonant detection. So uh, this slide shows how we uh, build the tetra spice model. The main innovation is uh, to is a, a multi-segment model with the uh, algebra. So um, the existing models are usually like a single channel model. And uh, for uh, to extend the that to the terrace frequency range, we add the Jude inductance, which is a kinetic inductance representing the electron inertia. And also uh, we split the channel into multiple segments. So the uh, Jude inductance is used to describe the electron inertia uh, effect and the multiple segment approach is used to uh, account for the non-uniform distribution of the terrace current in the channel. So uh, for our modeling, we use uh, the simple EKB model equations as a core of the uh, FET. So uh, we first calculate the required numbers of segments. This slide sh <coughs> shows um, we need more a number of segments at higher frequencies for longer channel devices with lower mobilities. And the number of segments could be uh, estimated by the channel length uh, divided uh, by the characteristic decay length for the electron oscillations. Uh, this slide shows the IV characteristics of the established uh, terra spice model. Uh, the, the advantage of the EKV model is that uh, uh, using the same uh, spice parameter values, the IV characteristics for the single channel model and for the multiple segment model uh, agree very well. And uh, we also use the SPICE model for the simulation of the terrorist response as a function of the gate bias. And we compare with the measured data, uh, which is shown in this slide. So, uh, we can see that the multiple segment model uh, could be applied for the ter uh, terrorist de detectors. And this also validates our model. And we also uh, simulate the terrorist response as a function of the terrorist radiation frequency. For uh, this that shows the results for different uh, channel length and uh, uh, different uh, numbers of segments. So uh, from the results, we could see that we need more segments for the model to be valid at higher frequencies and at larger channel length. And this slide shows the significance of uh, LJUDE in the terrorist spice model. So we simulate the uh, response as a function of frequency for different gate length with uh, LJUDE or without LJUDE. And uh, uh, we could see that uh, the JUDE analysis is uh, uh, significant at high frequencies.
uh, next, I will introduce the applications of the terrorist spice model. The first one is to verify a terrorist spectrometer. So uh, it has been uh, proposed to use a single transistor as a terrorist spectrometer. Uh, the principle is by uh, inter uh, in, uh, is by breaking the symmetry between the source and drain uh, with the phase shift of the terrorist voltages applied between the, uh, the gate and source and the gate and drain terminals. And uh, in the above threshold regime, the rectified voltage across the channel of the device could uh, uh, be calculated and uh, the analytical response uh, could be given. So uh, the theoretical response varies periodically with the frequency of the terrorist radiation and could be adjusted by the phase shift. This slide shows the simulation schematic of the spectrometer in ADS. And we use the harmonic balance simulation and uh, the spectrometer response could be uh, obtained from the difference of the uh, uh, DC component of the voltage at the drain and the source. We use multi-segment multi model here for our simulation. And the objective is to uh, use our SPICE model to uh, verify the analytical spectrometer response. So uh, here is a result. We compare the simulation result with the analytical res result. And uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, response as a function of the frequency for different uh, channel length and different uh, numbers of segments. So we can see that the spectrometer response has a periodic uh, variation with the terrorist radiation frequency, which is uh, uh, consistent with, uh, with the analytical theory. And we'll also see that we need more numbers of segments for higher frequencies and the larger gate length. And uh, this that shows uh, the spectrometer is uh, polarization sensitive, uh, which uh, means that uh, the response is tunable by the phase shift data. And also at a certain frequencies, the response could be zero at every single of uh, the phase shift. The simulation of the of the terror spectrometer also shows a unique feature of the uh, crossover frequency. The crossover frequency is uh, uh, defined as the frequency at which the response is uh, zero and changes sign. So, um, for uh, the the uh, left figure shows a schematic, and uh, here we use. Uh, input uh, resistance to uh, at the uh, source and drain uh, to represent the practical applications. And uh, um, the simulation uh, shows the response as a function of frequency at different gate bias. And uh, uh, the crossover frequency could be uh, attracted, uh, extracted in, in this simulation. And we can see that uh, the uh, crossover frequency is sensitive to the channel length, but uh, insensitive to the gate voltage in the weak and uh, uh, moderate inversion reg uh, regimes. Using this uh, unique feature, we could uh, use the uh, uh, 
the type of spectrometers for uh, the circuit design, such as uh, frequency to digital uh, converter. So we could use multiple. Uh, so uh, uh, this this application could be uh, implemented in the silicon technology. So you could use multiple uh, silicon uh, MOSFETs with uh, uh, decreasing channel length from L1 to Ln to uh, implement the frequency to digital converter. And uh, uh, we, we also use a comparator and uh, the encoder to read the, to, uh, the, the result. So when the frequency increases from the minimum to maximum value, the bottom comparator uh, will toggle its output at the lowest frequency, and the top comparator will toggle at the highest frequency. That is uh, basically the principle of the of this frequency to digital conversion. And uh, for uh, practical implementations, we need a higher spectrometer response for more sensitive detection and more ac accurate determination of the crossover frequency. Uh, another example is to use a SPICE model for uh, to verify resonant detection because uh, we could use S-parameter simulation in ADS to obtain the input impedance for the detector. And uh, uh, then we could, uh, we could tell if the response, if the resonance occurs at the frequencies by uh, checking if the imaginary, uh, imaginary part of the input impedance is zero or not. So here is a, a simulation schematic. So uh, this slide shows the simulation example. We, uh, the left figure is the response uh, as a function of frequency. So we can see that uh, at uh, different uh, mobilities, uh, the, the response shows uh, peaks at different frequencies. But uh, how, we, uh, how we could tell if the, there is reson resonance at uh, each peak? So uh, then uh, we could, uh, the right figure shows the imaginary part of the input impedance as a function of the frequency. So uh, by checking that, we could see that uh, when the imaginary part of the Z in is uh, zero, the peak is resonance. When the imaginary part of Z is not zero, the peak is not resonance. And uh, this, uh, Simulation shows that the room temperature resonant detection may not occur at a lower, a lower order resonant frequencies for relatively long channel devices. But uh, uh, for shorter channel devices, the room temperature resonant detection could could occur. This slide is a, uh, shows the example of the. 22 nanometer channel length. So for both the low mobility and high mobility cases, the imaginary part of the uh, input impedance is zero, which means the peak is resonance. And also the simulation simulated uh, resonant frequency agrees very well with the analytical uh, resonant frequency. Then uh, for the design of the terrace detectors for resonant detection, we could first uh, choose the proper gate bias and gate length for the desired resonant frequency uh, given by the analytical equation. And then we use the terrace spice model to obtain the input impedance from the S-parameter simulation. And then we could tell if the re resonance exists at the desired resonant frequency. And this. This uh, figure shows the uh, calculated fundamental resonant frequency as a at, uh, as, as functions of the gate length and uh, the gate bias. 
speaking. Yeah. Uh, four minutes more, but it's okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, finally, the, uh, is a summary. So we developed uh, the terrace spice model varied in the in a wide terrace frequency range from 0 0.1 to 10 terrace. Uh, we do the uh, we uh, what we did is uh, uh, we in incorporated the effect of uh, electron inertia by adding the Joule inductance, and we also use a channel segmentation approach. Uh, and the model our model showed good applicability of the for the simulation and the uh, characterization of a novel spectrometer, and uh, also used for the verification of a uh, Resonant and non resonant terrorist detection. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joaquin, for this pretty inspiring talk. And now we will begin with the question and answer session. Yeah. There is a couple of questions from Martin Hartman. First of all, thank you for the interesting talk. I have two questions. First, is it possible to correlate the wavelength of the plasma wave to the wavelength of the terahertz radiation? And if the answer is yes, how? Uh, correlate the wavelength of the plasma wave and the wavelength of the radiation? Yes. Uh, is it possible to correlate the wavelength of the plasma wave to the wavelength of the terahertz radiation? Yes, I think, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, so like, so in this slide, uh, it, uh, it shows uh, resonant, resonant frequency. Uh, and uh, this frequency is uh, associated with uh, like the gate bias and the channel length of the device. So uh, that means the frequency of the plasma wave could be uh, designed by uh, from from the like the uh, circuit and also the device. And uh, so, uh, if we choose proper uh, values, we could align that frequency, resonant frequency, with the frequency of the terrorist radiation, and in that condition, the resonant detection is, uh, is possible. Okay, thank you. Second question from Martin Hartman. What is the impact of the mobility on to the terahertz voltage created in the FET? Mobility of the... Yes, the impact of the mobility, mobility on, on the, the charge, uh, carrier charge. Uh, yeah. onto the terahertz voltage created in the in the FET? Uh, so the impact of the mobility is uh, uh, basically is uh, uh, we, we, we could uh, check that from the analytical uh, theory, analytical response. Uh, so you see the mobility is uh, uh, the electron uh, momentum relation time is uh, affected by the mobility. And that uh, parameter is an important parameter in the uh, unequal expression of the uh, detector response. So uh, for the, uh, for example, uh, Yeah, so here, this is simulation at different mobilities. We could see that uh, uh, the response, the both the, uh, like the property properties of the uh, peaks could be affected by the value of the response uh, of the mobility. So like for higher mobility, uh, it is um, more likely to have a resonant response. For like low mobility, the response could be more like uh, flat. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. There is a, a, a question from Aníbal Pacheco. First, thank you for this illustrative presentation. It is a quite clever approach to include Drud inductance to the EKV intrinsic model to create a compact model for terahertz hands. Do you think that if we change the transistor technology, for example, a graphene transistor, the same approach can be applied, adding the Drude inductance to the intrinsic graphene transistor model? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, yeah, then uh, maybe we need uh, the um, uh, different uh, spice model. It's basically, uh, like we could change the, 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 the equations for the spice model. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, second question from Aníbal Pacheco. In slide 29, um, 29 um, frequency uh, subindex CO shows a, a VG dependence for the shortest device in contrast to the other devices. Can you please explain the reason for this? Uh, the reason is not uh, very clear. I think um, for the um, uh, longer channel uh, case, it's also has it also has that uh, um, like increase when the gate bias is increasing. It's just the, the uh, if we plot, if we plot the uh, results for different, uh, different uh, gate lengths, it's more obvious for the sh uh, shorter channel length. But if we magnify uh, the result for the longer channel, it, it also shows that uh, uh, the trend. It's not uh, like in this in this figure. It looks like uh, uh, the Crossover frequency is a constant for the longer, longer channel, but actually if we magnify that, it is not constant. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Martin Hartman and Anibal Pacheco says, thank you. Uh, there is a, another question <clears throat> from Rey de Cel Torres. Thanks for the presentation. Which is the difference of uh, this time, uh, this type of uh, terahertz detectors? Uh, which is the difference between the layout from conventional radio frequency transistors? Is there any difference in the layout, contact layout, architecture? Which is the difference between these detectors and radio frequency transistors? Um, <clears throat> layout, I think. Uh, yes. The geometry, let's say. <laughs> yeah, I don't have uh, much experience with the layout, but I think uh, the main difference could be. Uh, the the antenna like for terrorist detectors uh it's very important to design a proper antenna to receive the terrorist radiation okay yeah okay um uh, red cell uh, says for instance radio frequency mosfets use multi-fingering to reduce the gate resistance here, uh, there is a multi-finger terahertz based on FETs detectors with multi-finger gate resistance. Oh. Multi-finger, yeah. I think uh, like uh, multi-fingers that uh, basically is uh, uh, you have uh, multi-fingers uh, representing a wider channel uh, 
a larger channel channel width. So oh, okay. yeah, okay. that's yeah, that, that that could also affect the response because yeah, here. Okay, perfect. Ray Desel says thanks. Okay, um, I think these are fast. Um, almost all the questions I have just a question um, we, can we go to the slide 18 please yes yes uh, so here um, uh, second uh, uh, sentence use the terahertz spice model in the terahertz device and circuit applications which is how non quasi static conditions in, in the device are taken into account into account sorry in the terahertz spice model because the conditions of the ch uh, charge carriers it is not yes. static or quasi static do you agree oh uh, yeah yeah okay. which uh, which is the way um, to take into account non-quasi-static conditions of the charge carriers here. Yeah, so uh, for that, the, the approach is to use uh, the multiple segments. So basically, uh, the, the, there are like two ways to account for that non-quasi-static uh, effect. One is to use uh, ELMO resistance. Another is to use multiple uh, segments. So we oh. use uh, multiple segments. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joaquin. There is no more questions. Um, can you stop sharing your screen? I will share uh, your diploma. Please. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just uh, a moment, please. Ready. Okay. Um, uh, no, uh, you, you're still um, sharing your screen. Um, can oh, you yeah, yeah. click on stop sharing screen? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Instituto Politecnico Nacional and the Eugenio Mendez do Curro Chair present this certificate of participation to Wekin Liu for his participation on the webinar, terahertz applications based on emergent and high performance elect electronic devices, part three, with the conference, compact field effect transistor models for terahertz detection. Thank you so much, Liu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have three minutes to begin the other talk. However, um, Dr. Ray Desel, uh, can you share your screen just to test uh, your audio, video, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Perfect. Can you could you um, go ahead to slides, please? Well, they I want the slides to be a surprise. But ah, okay, you... okay. <laughs> Let's no stay there. <laughs> uh, There's no problem. I plan the slides to to uh, to be completed in less than thirty minutes. So it's a. Uh, I know it's a long presentation, but uh, okay. So it works. I, I I will show it to you quickly here. It's a very simple presentation. There's no problem. Okay, it so. goes well. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, I will present you. Thank you to everybody to be here. Um, the next talk will be given by uh, Dr. Reydesel Torres Torres from Instituto Nacional de Astrofísica, Optica y Electrónica, INAOE, Mexico. The talk is called The Electric and Conductor Material Effects on, on the High Frequency Printed Circuit Boards. Reydesel Torres Torres is a senior researcher with the Electronics Department in AOE, Puebla, Mexico. He possesses more than 20 years of experience in developing models and parameter extraction methodologies for materials, interconnects, and devices used for microwave applications. Previously, he worked with Intel and IMEC, uh, VZW. He regularly publishes contributions on topics related to semiconductor and board systems technology. In addition, he has directed tens of master in science and PhD thesis, all within the framework of industry oriented projects related to high speed communications and several aspects of radio frequency circuit design. Professor Torres Torres is a member level two of the National System of Researchers S and I of Mexico's National Council for Science and Technology. Dr. Torres, you have 30 minutes of presentation and then there will be a 15 minute uh, question and answer session. So on your own, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I also would like to thank the organizing committee and Aníbal Pacheco for inviting me. <clears throat> So uh, this presentation is roughly divided into five points. Uh, I will first present some uh, basic concepts that will allow to uh, understand how high frequency signals propagate on PCBs. Uh, after that, I will present some details regarding the structure and electrical performance of dielectric laminates and copper foils used in PCB technology. And after that, uh, I will show some approaches to obtain the electrical response of these interconnects on PCB. This is a basic RC circuit in which I have colored in blue the wires used to interconnect the components. When you uh, use um, a classical circuit theory to analyze the circuit, you assume that uh, at a given uh, uh, time, at a fixed time, you have a uh, constant uh, current and voltage uh, along all these wires. It means that uh, in classical circuit theory, we assume that the conductors are equipotential structures. Now imagine that this uh, circuit is very large. If this circuit is large, then we uh, expect the uh, signals of the alternated currents at the beginning of the circuit to take some time to reach the lows. It means that in practice, interconnects introduce delay, loss, and also uh, a certain amount of signal reflection will be seen in a practical uh, circuit uh, uh, in, in reality. In order to explain this with more detail, uh, assume that we are having here in blue an interconnect uh, consisting of two wires. The wire on top is the signal path and the uh, one on top on bottom is the, the return path or the ground plane. If this uh, interconnect is ideal, we will uh, have to assume that if we apply an input uh, at the left-hand side of the interconnect, when it propagates to the end, the output will exhibit no phase delay. There will be no phase shift between the output and the input. The phase will be zero. And uh, the responsive magnitude would be flat. We will have the 100% one, of this input signal reaching the output. 
Uh, in addition, we are assuming that uh, no reflection occurs at the, at the beginning of the interconnect. We apply a signal and no, no signal is reflected back to the source. This is impossible in reality. And actually what we have in a practical implementation is that we apply uh, an input signal and the output will exhibit a phase delay there will be a phase shift between the output and the input. And also the uh, transmission drops with frequency. It means that we will have uh, some loss that uh, introduces uh, this, this uh, slope in the response. In addition, it is necessary to consider that not all the signal that we apply at the beginning of the interconnect will be injected into, into it, uh, but some uh, part of the energy associated with this signal will be reflected back. These, uh, these effects are accentuated at high frequencies and in uh, PCBs are substantial. So the question now is um, just to, to, I will ask, can you see the top of my slides or I have to adjust the size of, of the, the presentation? Hello, Mr. Chairman, can you please let me know if, if the slides are... Yes. Are... Okay, thank you. It's okay. Thank you very much, Professor. So uh, the question that now arises is, uh, how long does my interconnect have to be in order to consider a transmission line? Uh, it depends on the uh, length of the interconnect itself, and it depends also on the wavelength of the propagated signal. If the wavelength is too long, when compared to the length of, of the interconnect, I can use classical circuit theory to analyze the behavior of this structure. However, if frequency increases, the wavelength becomes shorter and the variation of the signal within the transmission line is uh, substantial. In this case, it is necessary to consider that the interconnect is a transmission line. There is a simple uh, criteria that we use in engineering uh, application to, to establish what this limit is, is uh, when the length of the interconnect is uh, bigger than one tenth of the wavelength at the maximum operating frequency of our circuit. Uh, furthermore, uh, there is also uh, an additional effect to be considered when we are working at high frequencies. Imagine we have this conductor that is floating over a ground plane, and uh, we expect that the current uh, follows a path that uh, exhibits the least resistance possible in, 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 uh, in the path. Uh, you can see in the ground plane that the current follows these shortest path that minimizes the resistance. However, when we work at high frequencies, what happens is that the uh, reactive behavior of the interconnect becomes more accentuated. In this case, uh, now the, notice that in the, within the ground plane, the path mimics that established by the signal trace. This is because now the signal follows the path of least impedance. It minimizes the inductance and maximizes the capacitance. Uh, in fact, there is a very important and fundamental parameter we use at high frequencies, which is the characteristic impedance of this interconnect, which is defined in terms of the inductance and capacitance. That's why it's very important to, to define the geometry of our interconnect to, uh, to fulfill the requirements of impedance. So uh, delay loss and impedance are important at high frequencies, and we will have to take into account that materials uh, and the structures will define the, the properties that uh, determine these effects. Uh, the question now is, what technology are we currently using for implementing high frequency circuits uh, today? Well, it's a PCB technology. We, our phones, our computers, they all use printed circuit boards, even though they are working at uh, gigahertz frequencies. So we will have to be careful when designing these PCBs. And that's what we're going to see, uh, what we're going to see hereafter. 
the first thing we should do when we are uh, working on our uh, PCB design is um, uh, knowing the geometry of our interconnects. For that, it is necessary to know what would be the uh, cross-sectional view of our PCB. Uh, in fact, a multi-layer PCB consists of several uh, metal layers. Uh, I have colored the, the metals in, in uh, orange and uh, several dielectric layers. All these layers allow us to implement uh, interconnects at different levels. Uh, so it is our task as uh, design engineers uh, to define the geometry and properties of all the materials that will be used in our uh, printed circuit board. So uh, the basic uh, building block of a multi-layer PCB is uh, the core. The core uh, is basically a two-sided uh, it's basically a two-sided uh, uh, board, uh, two plates uh, of metal, uh, metal layers, which are separated by a, a cure dielectric layer. This is basically what we can buy in an electronic shop as a two-sided uh, board. And uh, we know that we can etch the, the surface of this, uh, of this uh, board in order to implement our circuit. So if we want to build a multi-layer PCB, it is necessary uh, for us to, uh, to etch each one of these cores, these different two-sided uh, boards, and then we can stick them together using a material called prepreg. Prepreg allows to maintain uh, this joint so that we can implement a PCB of several, several layers. This is the uh, a photograph that we have taken in our laboratory, which uh, shows the cross-sectional view of a PCB that exhibits six metal layers. These are copper layers. And also it exhibits several um, dielectric, dielectric layers. Uh, at, uh, in, in, in the surface, we can see the solder mask. Then we see the different metal layers, and these are the dielectric laminates. These core and prepreg layers cannot be distinguished easily, and at the end, they both uh, behave as dielectric, effective dielectric materials that we will have to to uh, to consider when we are designing our uh, RFPCD. So the question is, how do you build these uh, these dielectric layers? And the answer is, uh, we use the same concept as if we were building a house. Uh, the roof of a, of a house is not made by concrete alone. It, require, it requires uh, steel rods to provide mechanical stability to the structure. We put the rods and then we can pour the concrete in order to, to form our roof, otherwise it can break down. The same concept is used when building these dielectric layers that we, uh, that we use for, for manufacturing PCBs. We use, instead of steel rods, we use woven uh, fiberglass fabrics. Uh, these are pictures uh, taken using a microscope. We see that we have uh, fibers uh, that uh, will allow to maintain the mechanical stability of our dielectric laminate. And it consists of several yarns. And, um, and the conclusion here is our dielectric won't be homogeneous. It will present different electrical properties depending on the position. Why? Because the, uh, these fibers are maintained together using a resin. Here we can see the, a sketch of the cross section of a PCB where we can see the copper layers. This can be a ground plane or a, or a power plane. And this is also a power or ground plane. And I have an embedded interconnect here. And I, I can see here the, the fabric, the, the, the fiber, the, the glass fiber here. 
And uh, we can see that the material is not homogeneous. So when a signal propagates into the screen, it will be interacting with this effective, with the effective properties of this composed material. So the permittivity and loss experienced by this signal will be result of the uh, combined properties of these two materials, the resin and the, and the fiberglass. In order to uh, explain with a little bit more detail uh, what's the interaction between an electric field and the dielectric material we are using, I'm showing here how the electric field varies uh, in position and time when I apply a signal at the beginning of this microstrip line. This is a top view of a microstrip line. I apply the signal here and I collect it here. And I can see that the electric field is changing in position and also is changing in time. This uh, change in the electric field will introduce losses because of the polarization effect. This polarization effect is due to the fact that when I have, a, for instance, a microstrip, this is copper, copper, and I have the dielectric laminate that allows the mechanical support of the structure and the solder mask, I can assume that the dielectric, uh, the effective dielectric can be represented by means of electric dipoles. It is, uh, this is a very simplified uh, figure. So these, imagine these are dipoles that uh, tend to align with the electric field. So we have an electric field and the dipoles align with this electric field. However, if the electric field changes with time, the molecules of the dielectric start vibrating and these dipoles tend to align with the, the electric field. In this case, what we see is that some energy will be spent in this polarization process and it will degrade the propagated signal it will also introduce a delay. This is a very basic effect occurring at high frequencies in a PCB. And uh, for that reason, uh, manufacturing companies, very important companies working for, for the electronics industry, they are engineering new materials to reduce the dissipation occurring in these uh, materials. If we use a classical FR4 material, the one that we can buy in the, in the electronic shop, uh, the, the loss is significant. Uh, and the dissipation factor, which is the figure of merit used to assess the, the performance of uh, um, a given dielectric laminate is uh, considerably high, 0.02, which is high for, for, for a dielectric used at, at radio frequencies. However, if we use an improved material that is specifically designed to be applied in high frequencies, it, the dissipation factor is almost one order of magnitude uh, of less um, value than, than the, the corresponding to the, to the popular FR4. So the proper selection of a laminate, of a laminate for, for a particular application is important. Uh, not only that, I also have mentioned to you that uh, the dielectric is not homogeneous. So uh, that is here. Uh, here uh, we performed an experiment in which we implemented over a PCB uh, a prototype that contains several, several lines traced at different position uh, at, uh, within a PCB. Then we measure the S parameters, process these S parameters, obtain the speed of the signal in each one of these, uh, uh, these uh, interconnects that uh, seem to be the same. And we saw a variation in the speed. Why? Because when they, these interconnects are traced over our dielectric laminate, sometimes it falls within regions with more fiber or with more uh, resin. So we see that the permittivity is changing with position. This, this is an undesired effect because we want all the interconnects behave the same. Otherwise, uh, for instance, skew, which is an unwanted effect at high frequencies may occur and, and be significant. We see here the variation in the effective permittivity obtained from these different interconnects. Also the impedance, which I have also mentioned is an important parameter, varies with frequency. 
it varies, sorry, it varies with position. We have several, several uh, lines measured, but then we repeated the experiment using a tightly spaced uh, material with, with tightly spaced yarns. In this case, we see that using denser materials allows to reduce the variation of the, uh, the impedance exhibited by interconnects uh, due to the homogeneity of, of, of the, the laminate. Not only that, a very interesting effect occurs at high frequency, which is called per periodic loading. Uh, what happens here is that uh, uh, interconnect represented here by this ye uh, yellow line sees these, um, perceives these yarns as defects. These def defects occur at, uh, a a periodically spaced. Then when half the wavelength of the propagated signal equals the period of these yarns, there is an effect called Bragg reflection. This Bragg reflection uh, originates that part of the signal goes back to the source and is reflected and can be measured as a return loss. Since this signal is returned back to the source, the transmission is degraded. So using uh, traces at different angles within, uh, within a PCB may be risky and may degrade the, the performance of our interconnects. Many of you perhaps have studied this in, in microwave engineering. Uh, uh, this is called the EVG effect, electromagnetic band gap uh, structure effect that is used, for instance, for practical purposes to implement metamaterials. Well, uh, let's uh, talk now about the, the conductor effects, the effects occurring in the conductor. Uh, and assuming that we have, are having here this microstrip, we have the signal trace and the ground plane. Uh, we are interested in observing what would be the current distribution within the metals. So here I'm showing the simulation of the current distribution at low frequencies. The current is um, homogeneously distributed within the whole cross-section of the interconnect. We have it here. Uh, red, this means that the current is approximately distributed in an homogeneous way. But as we uh, increase frequency, uh, the current starts confining in the surface of the metal structure. Here you can see that now the, the, the current in the, in, the met, in the ground plane is being confined just in the center of the interconnect and also the, the current start confining in the surface. If we increase the frequency even more, the, the current is almost completely confined in the surface. If we uh, translate this to an electrical representation, we can conclude that the resistance will be increased as the frequency increases because of this skin effect. In uh, microwave theory textbooks, you will find that the resistance is expected to increase proportionally with the square root of frequency. However, when we measure a practical PCB interconnect line, we see that the loss, uh, the loss is uh, higher than this uh, predicted uh, resistance. And this is because in order for us to adhere the metal to the dielectric layer, we have to intentionally add roughness to the metal surface because we, want, we don't want uh, the, the metal uh, foil to, to tear off the, 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 dielectric, the dielectric layer. Uh, then when we buy the, the when we buy the metal foil to form the multi-layer PCB, we have to inspect the surface in order to see if there will be enough adherence to the, uh, to the dielectric layer, but also we have to see this surface profile in order to predict what would be the loss that we will see at high frequencies. Because as I have mentioned to you, this roughness added to the foil will 
in, uh, introduce more resistance because of the scattering effects. Here I can show, it, show to you some uh, profiles. These are profiles of the metal surface. Uh, these, uh, these profiles are intentionally uh, produced uh, in the factory using electrodeposit. Uh, and uh, the, the, the competition between the different vendors is obtaining the less possible loss, but increasing the, the strength uh, of adherence of the, the copper layer with the dielectric laminate. This is the cross section of an actual interconnect. You can see here the roughness. And we have uh, implemented several prototypes to inspect the, um, the performance of different copper foils. You can see here that when we have a, a, a surface roughness characterized by a height of the peaks of the, of the roughness of two microns, we see a reference, which is the, the, the black, the black curve, and then we reduce, reduce the, the profile to, to, almost, uh, to almost a smooth profile, and we see that there is a significant difference. So if we are trying to get a better design, we need to pay attention to what type of copper foil we are using to implement our design. Uh, another important aspect uh, to, to be considered is um, that when we etch a PCB, uh, the etching will be different. We send it to different shops. For instance, here we have uh, several cross sections of the same interconnect. And you can see that the shape of the, of the microstrip after etching is different in, in, in each shop. You see, uh, this is high quality and this is very low quality. And so when we implement our designs, we see that when, when having this uh, extremely bad etching, we have a, significant, a significantly higher loss when compared to a good, good etching. So uh, bottom line here, uh, what... Uh, what you have to do when designing an RF circuit on PCB, you will have to provide to provide the manufacturer with the stack up. The stack up will let the manufacturer know what type of dielectric you will be using. For instance, here I, I am defining here a core that uses one ply of fabric of one style. This style specifies how um, tight the yarns are what's the percentage of resin, what the thickness of the, the layer is expected to be, and also what's the permittivity. We have to do that for the pre-prep, and we also have to do that for the thickness of the copper and what roughness we are going to use to adhere the, the copper foil to the uh, different dielectric laminates. This is when, when we firstly face this type of problem, we do not know what to do because we are, uh, we are used to get our PCB uh, from the shop and, and working on it independently of what material we're used to implement them. So uh, these are final uh, foils are dedicated to show you uh, some pictures of our lab in which we uh, use uh, needles, probes to, to get the electrical response of interconnects. This is a prototype we were uh, using to, to determine the electrical response of interconnects. This is very large. You can see this is approximately 20 centimeters. Um, and uh, we use probes at, uh, the same way we perform measurements on wafer to transistors and to, to RF uh, uh, circuits on, on silicon. The, it, the same concept is applied here. We probe the, the PCBs in order to get the electrical response. Uh, alternatively, we can use coaxial connectors directly attached to, to our PCBs. Uh, in this case, it's not that cheap uh, solution because microwave connectors are expensive, but uh, it, they allow to, to, to perform more robust measurements because when you use probes, the, the, the probes are, are prone to be uh, broken when we 
we, we measured uh, very large, very large uh, prototypes. Dr. Torres, three minutes more, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, also here, you can see alternative ways of alternative ways of measuring. These are, for instance, he, this is a universal test feature. Perhaps you may know it. This is used uh, typically for for uh, educational purposes. And these boxes here, for instance, are used to 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 measure. Uh, characteristics in um, motherboards. This is a standard defined by Intel. Uh, they use these boxes to, de to determine the properties of the interconnects that will be used in their motherboards. So uh, I only have one conclusion uh, that I want you to keep in mind when you design an RF. When you design RF circuits, you cannot trust anybody. You have to measure and see. And by measure, I, I I mean, you have to, to measure the electrical response, but you also have to measure the, um, the profiles, the thicknesses, the, the, the homogeneity of, of the materials you are using. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Torres. And now we have the question and answer session. First question from uh, Dr. Luis Manuel Rodriguez. Um, have you ever studied the advantages for electromagnetic propagation in transmission lines such as SIW, DML, in comparison with the strategies that you have presented today? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, the, this presentation was very basic. Uh, I, I apologize for that. But uh, yes, we have implemented SIWs. SIWs are, you know, we have uh, microwave electronics. We have rectangular waveguides. These rectangular waveguides allow to reduce the, the effect of the conductor materials because all the field is confined with the, that, the dielectric. However, on PCB, it is very difficult to, to build a rectangular, per, a perfectly rectangular uh, waveguide. In this case, uh, the SIWs, which are uh, synthetic rectangular waveguides, are implemented using uh, posts. Uh, uh, we call these posts uh, true holes uh, or vias. And, uh, uh, we have uh, seen that uh, the response is, 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 it shows an improvement over the conventional transmission line. The problem here is that these, um, these structures behave like a high pass filters, so low frequency signals uh, have to be transmitted in a different way. But very clever uh, question. Thank you for pointing out this, this, uh, this question. Okay, thank you. There is another question uh, from Aníbal Pacheco. Thanks for the presentation. Regarding the interconnects within a microchip, what do you think about interconnects with emergent materials such as CNTs within a, a silicon via or graphene interconnects? Have you studied them? Uh, yes, we have studied uh, interconnects on chip. Uh, the problem uh, is uh, compatibility. I mean, uh, you want you want to the to you want all the the structures to be compatible with silicon. Uh, now there is much interest in graphene interconnects because the minimized loss that they they achieve. Um, well, however, I have not performed uh, studies. I, I, I still have not studied graphene interconnects. I can tell you that the problem with uh, with the regular interconnects on, on chip is the coupling of the electromagnetic fields with the substrate. Eddy currents occur in silicon, and this uh, undesired effect propagate, uh, sorry, uh, dissipate energy, and the energy dissipation is is signal degradation. So it's a good opportunity for research working on graphene interconnects for, for future implementation of uh, microwave electronics. Okay, thank you so much. 
Okay. I have uh, an extra uh, question regarding mm -hmm. this uh, subject you have already talked about. Uh, what about these techniques? Uh, for example, uh, the studies uh, that you have uh, performed um, are up to frequencies around 50 gigahertz. gigahertz. So is that correct? Your measurements go up to 50 gigahertz. What about um, uh, frequencies between 1.0 terahertz up to 10 terahertz? The strategies implemented here uh, should evolve, uh, I think. But the classic materials such as metals and dielectrics, non-homogeneous dielectrics, will be useful to develop electronics at these higher frequencies, 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 uh, terahertz up to 10 terahertz. What do you think, Dr. Torres? Well, this is a very complex and clever question. Uh, first of all, in our lab, we are able to measure up to 120 gigahertz. We have done that to, to show the performance of, of PCB interconnects. And there are materials that work up to that frequency with, with uh, reliability. Uh, it, it is important to cover at least uh, several tens of gigahertz uh, because, for instance, now auto, uh, radars for automobiles are implemented with uh, microstrip patches that are implemented on PCB technology. And, and radars, uh, motorcycles use radars, and these, uh, these radars are uh, working at 80 gigahertz. So it is very important to perform characterization at tens of, of, of gigahertz. Uh, on the other hand, it is true that these uh, materials won't be uh, won't succeed in implementing uh, uh, circuits at uh, um, let's say uh, 500 gigahertz. However, as it happens with uh, with uh, semiconductor devices, at the end we will have a, a combination of technologies to to achieve a, a certain design. So uh, one section of the, of the circuit work operating at terahertz frequency perhaps will will go to the optical world, optical world and then we will have to to use down converters so that we can handle these signals using conventional conventional and cheaper options for for the corresponding processing. I know the the answer is not satisfactory, but uh, uh, that's what I can say regarding that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, apparently, there are no more questions. We thank you, Dr. Torres, for this interesting talk. It's a really, really exciting subject that you have presented. And I will share my screen to read your diploma. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Instituto Politecnico Nacional and the Eugenio Mendez do Curo Chair present the certificate of participation to Reidesel Torres Torres for his participation in the webinar, Terahertz application based on emergent and high, high performance electronic devices, part three, with conference, the electric and conductor material effects on the performance of high frequency printed circuit boards. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. No, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, okay, yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Henri Api. Good morning. Good afternoon for you. Yeah. Do you hear me very well? Yes, yes, we hear you clearly. Um, we can perform some tests in order to Share your screen. Okay. Yes, you can do it. Uh, could I share? I will make a test. Yes. Um, under the screen, there is a series of buttons. You can see a green button 
share screen. Oh, Click yes. on. Yes. And then select your presentation. Ah, good. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. Enlarge. Can you go ahead? I, a couple of slides, please. It's okay. It's okay. We can see it. There is no problem. Well, okay. We, we will begin in a few minutes. Uh, we have six minutes before begin the beginning. Okay. Thank you. I will begin in th two or three minutes more. Thanks. Thank you. Then uh, one question, <coughs> how many people are, uh, have registered on this uh, colloquium about? Ah, you will have 30 minutes to present. I will inform you five minutes before the ending of your talk. And then okay. there will be a 15 minute question and answer session. So in total, It'll be around 45 minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. We will begin shortly. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm going to begin. Uh, thank you so much to the audience to be here. Today, we are uh, going to uh, begin with the third talk of, talk of the day. Uh, this talk, talk will be given by Professor Henri Api. University of Lille, France. The talk is called Radio Frequency and Terahertz Applications of Two Dimensional Materials from Design to Characterization. Professor Henri Api received the PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Lille 1, Villeneuve d'Ascq, France, in 1992. He joined the Institute of Electronics, Microelectronics and Nanotechnology, University of Lille in 1988, where he is currently a full professor. Since 2004, he has been focusing on carbon nanodevices, carbon nanotube and graphene, these activities concern the understanding on, of fundamental limitations and improvement of high frequency performance of carbon devices and their applications in emerging fields of radio frequency circuits on flexible substrates. This includes graphene growth, either in silicon carbide, SIC and metal substrate, fabrication 
and characterization of graphene field effect transistor, FET. Professor Henri Api, you will have 30 minutes of presentation, then we, we will have a question and answer session. On your own, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this kind introduction. And uh, I want to say good morning to everybody. And uh, first of all, also I want to thank uh, Anibal Pacheco for inviting me at this uh, colloquium. So today, as you mentioned, I will talk about the uh, RF and TRS applications of 2D materials. So here is the outline of my talk. I will not describe everything here, but uh, since Anibal mentioned me that uh, this talk is oriented to master PhD student, I propose uh, this uh, uh, outline where I will briefly introduce my lab, research lab. And after I will introduce uh, 2D materials and uh, explain how to move from a new material to some applications, where are the problems to solve, and uh, especially in the field of RF and TeraRS applications. And finally, I will give some examples of applications we, that will be illustrated by uh, some uh, results. Uh, and uh, probably uh, students will find the correlation between my talks and the previous talk where people talk about the modeling and so on. Okay, so I, I want to say that uh, I make my research uh, at IUMN, which is an institute of electronic, microelectronics and nanotechnology. And uh, this lab is led by uh, Dr. Thierry Mélin. And uh, this lab is located in Lille, as mentioned by uh, the chairman. Lille is in the north of France, somewhere here. I don't know if you see my uh, mouse, my mouse on the screen. It yes, is in the north of Paris. Okay, it is in the north of Paris. Uh, it is about one hour from Paris, half an hour from Bruxelles, and. Uh, one hour and a half from London. That means it is very near of many big capitals in Europe. Um, this is a location of the lab. You have a website here where you can see the research lab, the research area in the lab because application is a very large field from uh, telecom to, to transport, to health, health application, and so on, you can connect on the website. What I want to mention also is that uh, we are in the lab, we have a very large facilities to de develop material, to fabricate devices, and also to make a characterization. Uh, at this level, we are a part, uh, I, I want to say also that we are. Um, member of a national uh, network of uh, fabrication and nanotechnology, the nano fabrication network in France, because the center as IUMN, you have a five center in France, one in Paris, another one in uh, Toulouse, in Grenoble and Besançon. That means if you people want to work in our lab, it will be a very good place with uh, very high facilities. For example, we have a characterization platform that can make measurement from, from DC to TeraRS applications. And uh, you have a website of uh, Renatec Network where you can find the uh, explanation of this. And finally, I will say that Lille is an attractive place for students to live and to make their study because you have an old fashion city and new city also. You have a combination of both. And if you want to have information about the University of Lille, you have a, a link in this address. So now I will move to the 2D materials in the scientific part of my presentation. Uh, what I want to say here 
is that I will illustrate in my talk how to move from material to applications. And I will take example of graphene to make this kind of illustration because typically when you have a new materials, you need to know properties of material. That, that means you need to make a fundamental physics. You need to learn how to grow the material and you need to validate the properties of the material according to the theory you have de developed. And you need to develop a fabrication process that preserves material properties. And uh, also you need uh, to have a, a modeling of devices oriented to design. That means you need to have uh, some compact model, some uh, most, I will say, simple model that could be used for circuit design. And uh, for sure, at each step of this development, you need to have a good characterization techniques to validate your result. So the example I will use today is graphene. And uh, graphene is a well-known material now, but uh, you are probably you have probably familiar with graphene. It is a monolayer of uh, graphite. That means it, it, it is composed by a single layer of atoms in a 2D uh, direction. Uh, what I will mention also that uh, graphene is uh, graphite is a kind of layer layered materials, and it is the this explain why the first uh, synthesis of graphene was was developed by mechanical exfoliation. That means since we have uh, we don't have uh, covalent bonding in every direction it is possible to remove uh, one monolayer by uh, mechanical exfoliation. This technique was developed by Andre Jem and Konstantin Novoselov in 2004. And uh, uh, relating to the work they made on this uh, material, they received the Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize in 2010. So they have demonstrated for the first time that it is possible to isolate a monolayer of graphene with this kind of techniques and they show the properties of graphene that was predicted by, um, by uh, physics, by uh, solid state physics studies. So today, since this uh, development, because mechanical exfoliation gives just a small flakes of graphene, researchers are working around the world to find the techniques to grow this material as, at large scale. For example, it is possible to, today to grow graphene on silicon carbide substrate by epitaxial techniques. It is possible also to grow large scale graphene by a chemical vapor deposition method. And it is also possible to synthesize, to make a chemical exfoliation. That means it is possible to have uh, this kind of material in solution. You can see here uh, some work made in our lab. In each of these fields, we have equipment to grow graphene by uh, on silicon carbide substrate. You have an illustration of material grow and uh, L, uh, STM uh, scales, uh, scanning tunneling microscopy image of graphene in the small uh, scale. We have uh, equipment to grow graphene by CVD, and we have developed techniques to transfer this graphene grow on metal on the, any kind of substrate, I will say, and using the printing equip, equipment, it is possible to design devices with a printing technology like inject printing, for example. All of these research are made in our research group. And uh, what is well known today is that uh, the quality of the materials 
depend on the techniques that are used to grow this material because although all of these materials are called in graphene, but uh, due to the growing techniques, you have uh, some defect, you have uh, many other parameters that impact the, the transport properties of this material. That means if, if we look for what we call quality in this graph, to have a very high mobility on graphene, typically people use a mechanical exfoliation. That just means that they use a very crystalline material without no defect. And it is well known that when you grow graphene by CVD or graphene on a silicon carbide substrate, there is some defect that reduce the properties of the material. And if you use a chemical exfoliation based on the impurity and so on, and the size of the flakes and so on, you have a very low quality, but you have for each kind of material, different kind of application for sure. This is an example of a material we work with at IUMN. That means you see today it is possible to make a very large scale material. But we will need to pay attention on transport properties when high frequencies as uh, mentioned as application. And since the discovery of graphene, uh, research, uh, research around the world find that there exists many layered material that could be exfoliated. And uh, people found also that uh, this material could have uh, several kinds of properties. For example, uh, graphene is here. It is a, a gapless material. That means we don't have band gap. But if we consider other material than like MOS2, it is a semiconducting a 2D material because we have a gap. And if we take material like uh, boron nitride, it is a dielectric material. That means uh, it is a dielectric material. Okay. That means that you don't have uh, any transport in this material. So today there exist many, many a large number of material. The main problem is how to grow this material and how to maintain their physical properties. Uh, I will focus my talk on graphene today, but you need to know that there exist many other 2D materials. And the problem is how to grow this material in the large scale for a given application. So to study all of these materials for sure, people need to learn about fundamental physics, the physics that govern these material. And typically, when we consider fundamental physics, I will, be, I will go briefly in this part. I will not uh, take a long time, don't worry. Uh, typically, we need to know the property of material. That means we need to know the, the bond structure of the material, what we call the bond theory, similar to silicon or other well-known 3D uh, semiconducting materials. So we need to know the bond structure of the materials, and we need to know also the electronic properties of the materials. That means uh, how the carrier populate the bond structure and how they move within the lattice of the materials. It is a kind of transport properties. And uh, typically, uh, for uh, to mode to extract this kind of uh, property of material, uh, we use, people use a quantum formalism. Uh, that means uh, they use uh, techniques like uh, density functional theory, which use at initial band gap cal calculation to extract, to investigate the material properties. Here, if you want, the objective that the initial theory consists of uh, 
use a, a few hundred and or thousands of atoms to extract the property of material. This is time consuming and need a very a specific quantum physics for that. Uh, another possibility, use, since we use a few atoms to model the material, it is not easy to design a device with this kind of techniques. Another uh, high precise technique is the tie binding approach, where, which is more faster than initial calculation. And uh, these techniques allow to describe a charge state a band, band structure of material and could take also into account the electronic structure and study transport phenomena. Typically, it is the techniques that is used to try to model device with a very high precision. This is an example of uh, modeling that could be achieved using these two kinds of approach where you can model the band structure. This is an illustration in 3D. Uh, the dimension, and this is a 1D dimension. That means if we cut this band gap along this uh, direction, we can have uh, this kind of uh, band gap structure, which is well known today for graphing. So this kind of uh, uh, physical study are needed when we use a new material to understand the properties. And uh, one can see that uh, if we compare the two previous techniques, the variation is not too high uh, according to the simulation um, uh, computing time, for example, we can see that uh, the, the, we have a good, uh, a, 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 good, a good comparison between the two models. These are physical models and uh, to try to make, uh, to simulate devices. For example, I take the example of, uh, so, sorry, I take an example of a transistor here. Uh, people use uh, what we call non-equilibrium uh, green function techniques to simulate the transistors. And in these techniques, the main problem always is how to connect uh, active part to the contact and so on, and to take into account the parasitics that may reduce the property of the device. But this technique could give the good, what could be a, the ideal value of uh, property of transistor. And for sure, uh, and, uh, when you process this kind of uh, devices, you have in fact of process that reduce the, simulation uh, result for sure. So it is not easy to simulate a large scale devices with this kind of techniques. This is just to mention that uh, this kind of study has required when we use a new material and when we want to de design new devices. And uh, if we compare the advantage of 2D material compared to 3D material that are well known for, for uh, circuit to use today, we can see that um, uh, when you use 2D material, the channel is well confined. You don't have a problem with degradation of potential in the channel because you don't have interface roughness between uh, the electric and the channel as in 3D material because you, you try to use a material that degrade the, a very, that avoid to degrade the properties of your channel. You don't have a dangling bond. That means you don't have a, uh, surface potential in this kind of uh, material that can introduce a variation of performance. The carrier are well confined in the ch uh, channel which has the size of a few Armstrong. 
in this, in when you reduce the silicon, it is not easy to achieve a few Armstrong channel. The reduction of the channel is not easy. Uh, that means uh, uh, this is combined to the fact that we expect also a very high mobility in graphene as mentioned by physical modeling. But if we consider now the impact of uh, material growth on physical properties, I will show here with two examples what could be a variation. Here, here is an example of uh, graphene grow on silicon carbide with, uh, I will show two different approach. This kind of graphene is grow in the lab on silicon carbide, but we grow this material in the ultra high vacuum conditions. Okay. And uh, when we measure, when we try to extract the property, physical properties of this material, we can see here with a uh, uh, measurement we call a ARPET, that means it is a kind of angle result photo emission spectroscopy that are made in the lab uh, we call Soleil in Paris. It is a, a accelerator of particles where we can uh, characterize the material with high precision. We can see bond structure of uh, graphene in this uh, kind of material. That means we have a linear bond gap structure are uh, expected by, uh, 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 by physics. And uh, unfortunately, in this material, the mobility is not uh, very high. It is around 800 centimeters square volt per, per second. We can achieve, achieve 1,000 sometimes. And uh, if you grow the same material with other conditions, that means if you grow the, this material not at ultra high vacuum, but at atmospheric pressure, for sure, the temperature of uh, grow is not the same. We have uh, many other changes in, in uh, grow parameter, but it is in atmospheric pressure. It is grow on silicon car carbide also. And uh, we can see we, we, we can see that uh, with this kind of uh, growing type parameters, we have a very uh, we have a high mobility on this material we can, which is around 2000 centimeters square volt per second that means the growing uh, parameters have a high impact on material properties and you can see that we are far from uh, 1000 uh, 100,000 of mobility as mentioned in literature, because of prob probably this graphene uh, is, uh, there's a high correlation between the graphene grow at the, on the surface of silicon carbide and the substrate. That means you have interaction of graphene and with the substrate. That means the mobility uh, is not high as expected, but this is a good result in this kind of material. And this is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of uh, graphene on a very small scale. That means it is three nanometers on three nanometers. It's the reason why you can see, uh, you can expect to see uh, uh, how the atoms are organized at the surface of this material. So, um, uh, as I mentioned before, the transport properties rely, uh, uh, the, grow, the growing technique have a high impact on transport properties. And uh, according to the material growth techniques, the mobility could, be, could vary a lot, okay? For sure, we can compare uh, mobility of uh, graphene with other uh, 3D material. We, we, we can see that uh, it's, uh, 
mobility, as I mentioned before, are not higher than the 3-5 material, but in some, uh, if you use really a very good crystalline material without defect, you can achieve a high mobility. And uh, typically in the public publication, mobility depends many times on how the mater material is grow and uh, what the techniques use to uh, how the material is prepared for uh, uh, characterization. For example, if you have a graphene suspended on the, in air, that means you don't have interaction with a substrate, with any kind of substrate, we can measure a very high mobility. That means uh, depending on the, of the condition where graphene is, you can have very high mobility. And you see here that there's a high variation of mobility according to the condition of measurement. So we need to take care of this when we work with uh, graphene material. Um, uh, professor, I, please, uh, yes? cinq minutes. Please. Thank you. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> I will, Thank you. I will try to go faster mm -hmm. on the device property. Sorry. So I will just mention here that uh, when we consider uh, graphene transistor, we can make a transistor with a typical structure of T gate transistor, like this, for example. This is an example of transistor fabricated on silicon carbide material. And this is the structure of transistor and the structure of T gate. Um, we can fabricate, uh, typically when we fabricate transistor, we fabricate also some uh, test structure to extract properties like contact resistance, for example. This is an example of uh, the, the transmission line uh, method uh, we use, structure we use to extract the properties of uh, contact. And uh, we make also a pattern to extract the mobility and charge density of the devices. And since the graphene have no pinch off, if we measure DC characteristic, we see that the, the current, the, we don't see saturation on current. And uh, this is bad for uh, real transistor, but could be used for uh, mixing, for example, because we have a linear characteristics here, and uh, we can use this kind of device in mixer, for example. Uh, typically, we can, I show what we call top gate devices. We can make a transistor with back gate devices. And uh, typically, we fabricate the gate, we transfer graphene on the top, and we deposit the contact of source and grain on the top of transistors. That means we have a de device that looks like this, where a channel is uh, open. And this kind of device can be used to make a photo detector, for example, because graphene is on the top of gate. Okay, that means according to the transistor uh, structure, you can have uh, several kind of applications. And we can make also transistor on flexible substrate where we can bend transistor and so on. If I move to process flow, I will move to procedure of characterization. As I mentioned, when we fabricate transistor, we use a, a transistor in the coplanar transmission line. That means it is possible to probe uh, RF properties of this transistor using this kind of uh, equipment, which are uh, vector network analyzer. Here it is uh, equipment that go to 67 gigahertz, but at IOMN we can go farther over than 300 gigahertz with this kind of equipment. I just show, typically when we measure a transistor, this is for students, I'm sorry. Uh, when we measure a transistor, typically we need to extract the performance of transistors. And what we call, what do we call 
performance of the transistor. Typically, you see that we measure the transistor, we measure the device fabricate uh, with, a with a access structure, and transistor is a very small part of this structure. That means we need to make what we call the D embedding to remove all the uh, what I could call parasitics on this device to get access to the intrinsic properties of transistor. This is a challenge of RF characterization. Typically, to, to do this, uh, uh, what, is the inter uh, what is the interest to obtain the small signal equivalent circuit? Because uh, this gives information on the material properties, on the pro fabrication process, and uh, it, gives, it gives possibility also to develop a more simple model for design, okay? So RF characterization is very important. And to make the embedding of this kind of uh, devices, we fabricate, uh, at the same time we fabricate device, we fabricate other uh, test structure, what we call a pad structure uh, or open structure, PAD is a similar structure and device, but without any devices that allow to extract all of these uh, access parameters. What we call open structure is a structure similar to transistor, but without graphene. That means it is possible to remove uh, active capacitances and so on. And finally, it is necessary to remove uh, the access resistance of the transistor that are illustrated in this graph. So we use a kind of uh, two-part uh, manipulation to extract all of these parameters. And finally, when you have this kind of parameters, you can extract uh, the gain and so on. And to see what is the impact of uh, this characterization, you can see here how the uh, current gain, gain change according to what we extract on the transistors. That means if you measure on the prop plan, you have a cutoff frequency of seven, uh, 17 gigahertz. If you remove uh, some parasitics, you move to 50 gigahertz. And if you remove uh, uh, res access resistance, you can move to 140 gigahertz. That means it is important every time to know what we are talking about. And uh, finally, uh, when we want to make a circuit, you need to use a two-part uh, calculation and to use a matching network to match input and output of your device according to what application you are focused on. I take one example here where an uh, amplifier is fabricated. You have a transistor somewhere here and you have a matching network is an inductance at the input of these transistors. And you can have a, a gain with this kind of transistors, even if you don't have a pinch off. I have illustrated also here a kind of splitter. That means it is a circuit where you put a signal and you have a, an output to signal with opposite phase. This is something we have uh, designed and fabricated in the lab. This is a characterization of this circuit. And you see that we have, uh, we obtained uh, two signals with uh, different phase as output. But since we don't have a gain, high gain on these devices, the loss of, on this uh, output signal is high. We have 20 dB of attenuation anyway, because if you see the, the ratio here, you have 20 dB of attenuation. I show another thing which is not transistor, but which is a new application of this kind of 2D material. It is a kind of a switch. It is a passive switch. 
uh, non-volatile switch, which are used for RF applications. Typically, uh, our, the device is very simple. It is a metal, 2D material and metal in the top. The, this device is insert in the coplanar transmission line. According, uh, depending of the voltage you applied to this material, the material can switch on or off. That means you have a short circuit be between the two metals. This is a monolayer of uh, 2D mass. For example, we can put a, a borom nitride, one monolayer of borom nitride in this kind of device. We can show the, here that we, this device can switch on and off, okay? And uh, using this kind of device, we have published uh, a nice paper in Nature we, in collaboration with University of Texas. We have made measurements on this kind of uh, devices up to 325 gigahertz using this equipment. And uh, you can see that uh, we have a good variation between on off stage at this level. That means we can use this switch to switch a high frequency circuit in a very wide frequency range. This is an example of application. It is not transistor, but it is a properties of 2D materials. And uh, finally, I, I finished. Thank you for extra time. And I want, just want to say that uh, there's a high hype on 2D materials and that you can find application of this material in many, many applications. And uh, 2D have impact on multidisciplinary R&D effort because we can use uh, this for use 2D material for mechanical uh, properties. We can use it for, uh, if I take the case of information and technology, we can use for RF electronics, we can use for flexible electronics, wearable electronics, and so on. That means uh, there's a many, many application for this, this new kind of material. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me extra time. I want to acknowledge my colleague that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. And uh, this work is supported by a European project calling Graphene Flagship. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Merci bien, Professor Henri Api, for this uh, encouraging presentation. And Thank now you. We will have the question answer session. There is a couple of questions from Anibal Pacheco. First of all, thank you for this complete, complete picture of your work. Question number one, along your presentation, you show that interaction between material scientists, device modeling engineers, and circuit designers is required. How important is for you this collaborative approach? Do you manage to cover the three aspects, fabrication, modeling, circuit design in your lab, or do you require partners or students for it? Uh, I, I will say in the three aspects, we have a collaboration but as I mentioned also at the beginning in the lab, we can do everything, but we can do everything in the lab, but we don't have uh, all the techniques in the lab for sure. Uh, in, for example, for material growth, we have uh, one techniques. So we need to collaborate with other people to test different kinds of material for sure. Okay. This is one point. Another point is that uh, I agree, we don't have uh, many people working on design. So we have collaboration, for example, with colleagues of Bordeaux, where, where we work sometimes, because for example, this uh, circuit was designed by Bordeaux and fabricated in IUMN. So we have uh, many, many collaborations for that. And the third point, if we need a PhD student, yes, I will say yes. 
And this is the reason why I say to PhD students, we are open to recruit a good, if they want to continue the PhD in Lille, they are welcome. Okay. They can contact. This is just one aspect of research in the lab. It is not all the research of, of the lab. So they can connect on the lab and they, they can find many, many other uh, works. I try to focus this in research in my group just to have uh, many, many illustrations and many, many aspects. And uh, concerning, for example, this work, we have a collaboration with University of Texas. That means the, the device I mentioned here was fabricated in Texas but the characterization was made at IUMN because they don't have facilities for characterization. That means it is a real collaboration. We learn from, from others, we need collaboration, but we try to do also, we collaborate a lot. Okay, perfect. Second question. Regarding the two-dimensional radio frequency switches, what is better for high high speed applications? Uh, molybdenum uh, disulfide switch or an hexagonal boron nitride switch, which is better? I will say it. today we are looking for that, I will say. Why? Because uh, uh, I will say we use both. What, what are we looking? The switching voltage. We, we need to have uh, to reduce the switching voltage to reduce the consumption, I will say, to reduce power dissipated during the switching. And um, we need also to I will say to improve um, the, uh, the yield of this kind of material because when you fabricate material, how many of them are working and so on, we need to see for that. And we need to increase the number of switching, also the robustness of switching, uh, how many switch we can do before breaking the material. Uh, remind that we are talking here about uh, atomic layer. That means it is a monolayer. We are fabricate switch with monolayer of boron nitride. We want to fabricate switch with two monolayers, with three monolayers to understand exactly what happened during the switching and so on. And these are something we are looking for. So today I cannot say this is robust than this one. But what is sure is that it is a very simple switch compared to other kind of active switch. Because today when we make switch with a CMOS, for example, and so on, but the circuits are very, very complex. And uh, you cannot go at very high frequency with uh, active switch like, the, like this one, for example. This is things we are looking because, as I mentioned, the switches, the structure look like this. You don't need a transistor, you don't need uh, anything. Okay, okay. Excellent. Uh, question number two is uh, an open question. <laughs> it's yet to be answered. Okay. Um, yes, I have another question, Professor Api. Uh, Anibal says, thank you. Can we go to the slide 25, please? Uh, let me see, 25. Slide 25. Yes, please. There is an interesting effect there or result you have presented. Uh, for instance, there is a different um, substrates here um, where uh, graphene is, is, uh, is um, ground. What is the physical reason that the mobility for uh, graphene on silicon carbide with H2 intercalation 
has a better mobility than the rest of the material uh, the, of the substrates. Okay, I will come back here. When you grow graphene on silicon carbide, uh, I don't have a graph here. Typically, silicon carbide is composed of silicon and carbon. That means you need to heat to remove silicon and the carbon that remained on the surface connected and form graphene at the, on the surface, okay? Sometimes you see it is showing here, you have a good graphene on the surface and uh, you have graphene below this graphene also that are connected somewhere with the substrate, okay? Due to this interconnection, it is not easy to, you have interaction between graphene and the substrate. And typically people try to intercalate uh, hydrogen in this part to saturate this uh, covalent bonding oh, okay. and to left the graphene free on the top. And okay. this is typically the reason why we say by reducing the interaction between graphene and the substrate, we improve the mobility on the graph of the graphene. So, on the so hydrogen avoids dangling bonds. Yes, yeah. between, yes. It make a kind of, uh, yes, this is ah. one explanation. Perfect, perfect. Okay, um, I think we, we don't have more questions. Um, Professor Api, we thank you so much for your presentation. And now I will read your diploma. So yes. can you stop uh, sharing your thank screen? Thank you, please? sorry. Thank you. I want to say to the student, if we have a student in the audience, if they yes. want to continue in Lille, they can contact me, they can connect in the website and they are For welcome. Sure. For sure. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so uh, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now. Uh, the Instituto Politecnico Nacional and the Eugenio Mendez do Curro Chair present this certificate of participation to Henri Api for his participation on the webinar, uh, webinar Terra Health Applications Based on Emergent and High Performance Electron Devices, Part 3, with the conference Radio Frequency and Terra Health Applications of bidimensional materials from design to characterization. Professor Api, thank you so much to be here. And we will be in contact for sure. One student will contact you um, to work with these uh, exciting subjects. Thank you so much. Thank you also, thanks. Well, um, to the audience, uh, thank you to be here. We invite you to follow us in our social media networks, YouTube, Twitter. We invite you to uh, stay connected with these um, uh, social media networks because the sessions of the uh, chair uh, for this year haven't finished yet. And um, well, there will be more webinars on December this year. So you'll be welcome. Thank you to everybody and have a nice day. <laughs> bon fin de journée, Professor Api. Bonne journée à vous. Merci. <laughs> Merci. Vous c'est le soir, vous c'est le matin. Merci. <laughs> Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée.